All right, so I'll take a second to introduce our speaker today. Uh, with us, we have Michael Hammond, uh, and he comes to us from Design Concepts, which is a, a company down in Madison where he does design work. Uh, there, he is the director of industrial design. Uh, he's been there for a little over a year, and prior to that, he was at Trek for 14 years um, working in their design. So, with that, I'll let Michael take it away. Thank you, Doug. All right, thank you. Everyone actually coming, showing up, and listening to me today. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, good enough. <laughs> so, uh, how many of you intend to graduate from this school as a mechanical engineer? Good. The ones that don't are probably just going to hang out here for the rest of your lives, I'm not sure. But, um, and how many of you anticipate working with industrial designers? How many of you know really what industrial designers do? Yeah, good enough. All right. Well, we're going to get to that. Um, this is my talk. I'm a designer, and so can you which is a little bit of a rip-off of Stephen Colbert's book, I Am America, and so can you, but that's a joke. Um, a lot of art degrees end up doing something completely different. Um, I, unfortunately, or not, I fortunately stayed stuck with industrial design uh, throughout my career. All right, so, let's see. Michael Hammond, that's me. Um, I graduated 19 years ago, which makes me pretty old at this point, uh, with a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Design. Um, and, as Devin pointed out, um, I'm in the industrial design director at a place in Madison called Design Concepts. It's a product development firm that's been around for 15 years. We've got about 10 designers, uh, 20 mechanical engineers, a um, bunch of electrical engineers, and a few human factors engineers, among other people. Um, it's a really cool place, and we design a lot of, design and develop a lot of different products. Um, and I happen to be one of 9,843 Michael Hammonds on LinkedIn. Actually, I made that number up, but there's a lot of Michael Hammonds on LinkedIn, which is quite a surprise to me. Fortunately, I was number one, but that's probably because I searched for myself. <laughs> All right, so um, I'll be paging through my notes here because I often forget what the heck I'm talking about. But why, why am I here in front of you guys? Um, talk about industrial design. And I want to give you as much as I can in the next 45 minutes about industrial design, what we do, how we think, all that sort of thing. But I think what's really important for me to get across is that mechanical engineering and industrial design are inseparable. We are, like this, a symbiotic relationship that happens. And it's really important to think about it that way. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we do things, how we think about things, and how you guys can leverage our skill set. I'll give you a little background on me, establish some, you know, some street cred here. Um, my dad was a mechanical engineer. Worked for Boeing, he worked for Milwaukee Electric Tool for most of my life. Um, he was a machinist, he did all sorts of things. And he really loved cars. And here we are, that's me, working on my mom's Dodge Dart back in 1980. And just so you know, digital cameras were not as good back then, so it's a little fuzzy. Um, not as a joke for those who didn't know that they didn't exist back then. But what's interesting is that my dad, being really into cars, he would take me to a lot of car shows. Dragged me along, and I started to like him once I started to get older. But he really had an appreciation for design. He really knew about, you know, you could see a car from a distance. He would know generally how old it was, like what model year it was, what model it was, what brand it was, and he just kind of knew these things. And I think he had a real strong sensitivity to those things as an engineer. <coughs> and I think that made him um, a better engineer for it. So this is me, and you know, some, things, some of those things rubbed off on me. Um, and in first grade, you know, I kind of was thinking, like, oh, I want to be like my dad, I want to be an engineer. Drawing kind of all the crazy engine stuff that he would work on. And then as I grew up, I um, started to get more, you know, paying more attention to the design side of things, the branding side of things. Um, thinking about designing bikes, you know, fortunately I became a bike designer for a while. It worked out pretty well. Um, wasn't so good at marketing, calling this bike the Shocker. That's not a good name for any product. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I've been working as a professional ever since I left this school 19 years ago. And I think what's been interesting, it's always been insinuated that there's going to be this tension between mechanical engineers and designers all the time. And they're going to make, well, you just want to make everything square. Well, you just want to make everything really, really fruity and fluffy. Well, yeah, you know, so I still hear that today <coughs> at the school, you know, 19 years later. And we poke fun at each other. And I think that's, I think that's fairly healthy. But I think 
what I want to get across to you, this next generation of engineers and designers, is that more importantly, you can poke fun at each other, but you need to know that your teammates are really important and that symbiotic relationship is really important. I'm going to repeat that probably a zillion times. Um, so, you know, over all that 19 years of, of work, these are all things I've touched, and there's probably, I could probably fill three slides like this. Um, I've worked with some amazing engineers, and I couldn't have gotten any of this done without mechanical engineers backing me up. And that's a really important thing because product development is very much a team sport, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and this is the, if you walk out of here with one key point, this is it. It's not about me being the designer, it's about us being the designers, okay? We're a team. Um, I think you're going to graduate here with a specific role as an engineer, but being an engineer is just part of it. It's about what the team is trying to accomplish that's more important. So whether you're working with product managers, business people, salespeople, or industrial designers, knowing how your role fits into that and how you can help perpetuate or propel things forward is, is what's most important. And getting comfortable with that early on in your career, not just thinking, I'm the engineer, I'm going to do this. I'm the engineer, I'm going to contribute in this way. Kind of changing that mindset is really important. So, like I said, product development and design is it's a team sport. Here you see, you know, quarterback, you see Aaron Rodgers there, you see the defense, and you see the offense, and you see all the different players in there. These guys all have their specific roles, but they're first and foremost football players. And what am I going to say there? That was important. Important stuff. Um, I think when you, just kind of repeating what I just said, um, you got to, you know, kind of, if these guys anticipate each other's needs, they know what needs to happen. So when you're on a product development team, and it's very much a contact sport, and people do get hurt in product development, probably more emotionally than physically, but you need to be able to, to know what each other needs. And you kind of have to empathize with how they think about things. Put yourself into their shoes. So I'm, as a designer, putting myself into your shoes as a mechanical engineer, trying to anticipate how you're going to think about something or what you're going to need and vice versa. That's really important. That's what these guys do every day on the field. This guy, important industrial designer, honestly, don't really know that much about him, other than he's important. I should know a lot of stuff about that, but that stuff is probably stuff learned back here and long forgotten. So, um, but I think this is a really important statement. Intimate collaboration between engineers, designers, and the client. Um, he said this 60 years ago, and he realized it back then. And Again, collaboration and teamwork really only works when there is empathy for one another. So, taking time to learn and listening to me today and starting with this, understanding how designers work and designers in some other classroom, understanding how engineers work is how we all get better at product design. Because <laughs> when, you, when you get out of here and you get that first project out of school and you're working with you know, that team, you might get to work with a designer like this guy here. This is Brad, he's a mechanical engineer, and I worked with him a few years back at Trek. He's the kind of designer that clearly sees that symbiotic relationship. He's also the kind of designer, no, I'm saying designer, not just engineer. He's also the kind of designer that pushes to make things better. He's always pushing me as an industrial designer, like, what if we did this? How about we try this? That's probably not going to work, but we can look at it. He's not just saying no, he's looking and investigating with me. And we're working together um, in the back and forth. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about him in a bit. I want to get across some design designer fallacies and biases that you might think of. Um, you hear designer and kind of how the media populates what designers are. You think of this guy, right? And they just do that, and poof, they make money, and you hear just about the one person. There's a whole army of people, engineers, designers, and product developers behind that kind of person. Um, that are that are doing the work and I'll tell you there's no such thing as just doing the industrial design or just do the engineering those two are always interrelated because I think when you look at product development today in 2019 holy cow it's complicated there's a lot of things going on especially when you start considering the digital interfaces and mechanical interfaces and how the experience is supposed to be which I'll dive into in a bit um, there's this increased seriously increased level of uh, product complexity. 
And you see mechanical engineering here, but you could probably even dive into that anymore. And you see all these different subsets, you know, composite engineering and someone who understands mechatronics and all these other different things. So who knows where you end up once you leave this place. You might get to a really narrow, specific area of mechanical engineering. And that's pretty cool, actually. Um, the other kind of design fallacy I want to get across, this is not what we really do. We don't sit around making pretty pictures and saying, hey, here you go, make this happen. That's not, not how it goes. Um, we are good at usually usually good at making pretty pictures, um, but real design, real product development, and for all of us in here, is about understanding new user needs, understanding their problems, and going out and solving for those. Right. So you may have seen this before. <coughs> this has been I call it formally known as the design thinking process. It was a big deal 10, 15 years ago. Oh, design thinking, and I was like, I'm a designer. I think like a designer. What do I need design thinking process for? And I still kind of think that in a way, this makes sense to me in the sense that it's the product development process. This is our process. There's a lot of details in here that are not shown, I tell you that. But whenever we can go up, understand users' problems together, right, and start to define what those problems are, and from that we start saying, hey, we could do this, we could do that to solve it, and we're working together, and we start to ideate, draw pictures and things, we start to make prototypes, we start to test those prototypes, there's a vicious circle of, of test and repeat right there. And eventually, we start to do mechanical you know, uh, engineering drawings and get into production and all those things that happen. Um, it's really cool. But you'll find when you get out of here, a lot of companies aren't going to put the designer and engineer together way out here. They think, oh, it's the designer's work to do. I disagree, but you know, status quo sometimes is a little tough to overcome. Um, unfortunately, I work in a consultancy where that's, that's sort of promoted where we are up together doing the research. But I think when you see the opportunity to do the research way up front and really see how people are using the product, it's really important. And don't hesitate to, to get out there and do it. Um, here's that same exact slide I just showed you, just in a different way. Going out, understanding what sucks, right? That carrot peeler is terrible. And it's hard to use, and it cuts your hand, and it hurts your hands, and it's just hard to hold. So you go and you say, okay, we saw these things. We saw how people were using it. They were using it backwards. They were cutting themselves. How can we solve that? And the industrial designers are thinking of ways of articulating that visually. I'll give them that too. And then you start doing that prototyping, right? You start coming with all these prototypes. And meanwhile, we're working back and forth. Like, what can we make this out of? Can we actually push the material to do this? Can we do that? Is this going to be strong enough? How long does the shaft in here that we can't see need to be? Can we make it lighter? All these different questions. I mean, product development is just this giant cloud of questions that you're trying to narrow down until you answer as many of them as you can before you hit the go button on uh, production. So another critical point I want to make, and I hope this you leave the room thinking about this. Um, great industrial designers you know, are thinking like engineers, and great engineers are thinking like designers. Again, symbiotic relationship. You need to be able to anticipate each other's needs. Um, while we're working within that design process that I was showing you, we have to be you know, using these skill sets at specific times. Um, but it's all about augmenting each other as a team. There's no longer this handoff that it doesn't go from department to department. And when it goes from design to engineering, we don't just ignore it. And it's like, oh, it's out of our hands. Engineering's got it now. It doesn't work that way anymore. You'll never see that, even if people say you're going to see it. You're not going to. Um, there's these compromises and back and forth that's really kind of the most fun part of the work. Uh, it's way better than those are digital, but that's okay. Okay, so <clears throat> we should drill into that a little more, that statement of, you know, a great designer has a bit of engineering them and, and vice versa. So here, I just kind of made this up, right, kind of off the top of my head. Some of these are a little bit cliche, I think, but you can see some that match, right? We love the process and we love making stuff. Love solving problems, and we all think visually. We both think visually, but in different ways. Uh, but you see some major differences here. And these are some assumptions about mechanical engineers from, from my point of view. But you guys love being concrete, and ambiguity is terrible, and you love math and metrics where designers hate numbers, and you want to be all kind of away from those. Um, we all, we're always trying to instigate risk by trying new things, and design, or the engineer is always trying to mitigate risk. Um, so when it comes to empathizing with each other and understanding each other, what, what things could we change that would help us work together better? Well, 
man, it'd be nice if the industrial designer would adhere, actually adhere to the laws of physics, right? Like not trying something out in space or something so thin that it's impossible to make. Those kinds of things that I still see happen and it blows my mind. Um, actually knowing how something gets made. Like how critical is that? I push my designers all the time. They come in from wherever school and they don't actually know how things are molded. And you're like, you got to learn this process. Get on YouTube, start watching some videos, start figuring this out if you can't get to a factory. I was lucky enough to kind of get out of school and go work where they were making the products, so I got to learn a lot quick. Um, not everybody can do that nowadays. Um, I think this is an important one. I think this is probably applicable to both, but no one to stop designing. You know, you'll keep changing things on the engineer and they keep having to go back and revise their SOLIDWORKS CAD and their whole database, and it just causes a lot of problems. You got to know, you got to empathize with them. You got to, okay, they got their deadline. This could be better, but is it really that important? Let's let's stop here. Um, and I think I think there is some struggle with most of the engineers I've worked with embracing that ambiguity and that kind of weird intangible space. Um, and I think it's not that you guys don't focus on user needs, but I don't think you get the chance to as much. I think per what I was talking about earlier, a lot of companies just think they're going to bucket you into this area and they're going to bucket the designers into this area to go focus on their user needs, um, and that creates gaps. Uh, so. Let's think about how maybe designers could help you augment your, your skill set and uh, address some of those orange ones that I just listed there. So this is the very dry, oops, very dry uh, definition of industrial design that you'll see on Wikipedia. Um, but what, what is that? There's a lot of words there, right? What does that mean? Um, I think when you really think about industrial design, now we're talking about what it actually is. Designers are focused up here. They're focused on user, user needs and making something that people want to buy, want to, it's attractive to them, it functions well, it feels good in their hand, whatever that is. Where industrial, or the engineering team is always kind of focused on, let's get it out the door, let's make sure that everything works, make sure it works a thousand times or a million times, um, and then we can manufacture it at the right cost. And then you got the business people over here talking about making sure they're doing their market research, making sure that it's the right thing for the market and that they're getting their margins and all these other things that they talk about. And as with all uh, Venn diagrams, you get this sweet spot in the center, and that's what we're aiming for as a team. I think what you'll see kind of in the workplace now, we're going to push, you know, as engineers and designers, we're both pushing more into here too, right? We got to understand the business. We got to understand some of the numbers behind the decisions that we're making and how they affect things downstream. So we've been talking about physical product design, at least that's kind of how I've been framing this, this talk. Um, what is that? That's not important. Um, so I think we think about the physical world and we don't kind of grasp that pretty well. It's pretty tangible. Um, know what you're going to make and you'll kind of kind of visualize what it's going to be in the end and um, these are all the things you buy the stuff you kind of hire to do a job for you you buy a car to hire you to get to work you're hiring the car to get you to work or you need something to entertain you, you need something to save your life whatever it may be but then you get into product experiences and if you step back a little bit this is a much bigger bigger realm and you think about how do you want people to feel about your product or experience. That feels a little, that kind of question's a little weird. You start to talk about emotions and how people react to things and psychology. And this is stuff where designers end up playing a lot. And um, <coughs> it's very intangible. And I think for a new product development team, um, if you don't have someone that can help you navigate that, it can get pretty messy pretty fast. Fortunately, I'm gonna go through three superpowers of industrial designers that you can leverage and help augment your skill set, we're really good at dealing with ambiguity. And you'll see why in a minute. Um, we're good at taking a lot of inputs, a lot of like research inputs. They said this, they said, we saw that, and all these things. And all these things come together, and we start to kind of see patterns. And from those patterns, we start to harness the insights. Insights lead you to product concepts or ways of solving the problem um, that we can actually work to. And we start to sketch those out and become more tangible. <coughs> so that's great. And sketching's a Probably the most important part of our skill. And I don't mean sketching, I should say this as visual communication. Both of us, and I say both me and this group of mechanical engineers, we need to know how to visually communicate. You don't have to sketch like this. 
Everybody's like, oh, I'm not an artist. I can't. Do Don't care if you're not an artist. You can visually communicate, right? You can draw a circle. You can get the point across. It doesn't have to look like this, but visual communication is an industrial design forte. So it, what it helps you do, like, you can have these meetings where people are just talking back and forth about how it could work or how it could look. Until someone puts something on paper like this, you've got no direction. So this helps make it tangible. That's what, that's how designers help solve that ambiguity by drawing and making it tangible, making something that you can wrap your wrap your mind around. You know, another example. This was actually a really cool project for. Go to the bathroom, you go and wash your hands, and then you or put soap in, wash your hands, and then there's a dryer right there. So it actually became a real product. Um, and there's a ton of of cool mechanical engineering stuff behind this that I'm not going to be able to get into. Um, I think when you think about by sketching out options, you figure out which ones are worth pursuing. And this is pretty straightforward industrial design. We're talking about kind of form and material and how this thing looks. But pretty soon, you know, you start to get into CAD and you're working back and forth as a team, starting to say, well, we need to move this here because that clearance isn't going to work. And there's just this awesome comp system of compromises that happen. And I compromise in the most positive way because I can tell you that there's a lot of design decisions that if they just let me go with it, it may have function fine, but probably wouldn't look as good as if the engineer got involved. So it actually happens to, uh, to work out really well. Are you sleeping? Gotcha. There's <laughs> no sleeping in my, my talk. That's okay. It's not that, that's not that great. Um, so industrial design superpower number two, telling stories. All right, this is important and um, it's a tough thing to to do. I think with any of those ideas, all those sketch, sketches and models that we make, we have to be able to put those into context and help people understand them. Just putting a sketch on the table or a model on the table isn't going to get you anywhere. You're going to look, what is that? I still can't wrap my head around it. So that's where storytelling comes in. So we look at this. Um, if you look this up on our website, it's flipping amazing what it actually does. This is a device that replaces a heart valve. So actually there's a long tube that comes out of this thing with wires and stuff and you can actually go in through uh, through here up through here into their heart and replace a heart valve okay and it's all done mechanically there's no electronics in this thing that's what's really cool about it. it's all about turning that little knob so you think about that you know you've got this mechanism you start to figure out how different ways the engineering teams kind of like I don't know let's brainstorm and figure out different ways of, of getting that uh, heart valve placed in there and get the tube back out so there's a lot of questions to answer there. And then you start to say, okay, what is that going to look like? Because, you know, you can't grab onto a bunch of gears and springs, right? That's not going to be very comfortable for the doctor. It's also not very sanitary. So we have to think about how this thing going to look and how we're going to cover it up. And meanwhile, not only are we thinking about how it's going to look, but what areas are they going to touch? Are they going to touch here? Should we indicate some sort of grip there? How are we going to indicate that this thing spins? That's how you operate it. So there's some storytelling there that starts. And then you get even farther into this storytelling, talking about user scenarios. We map these out, we show how this is one concept, this is how they will end up using the product. Um, another way of looking at storytelling is something we do called an experience map. Um, this is a really crude one I put together for a blog post, but I think it's, it's interesting. And again, it's an important use of storytelling to keep, help people see the bigger picture in this case. So let's say you're on your first job, you work for Weber, and the boss wants you to make the next awesome grill and it needs to cook really well. It needs to cook better than ever before. So as a team, you know, you might be focused on kind of the design of the burner and the thermodynamics there. And that's all you're focused on. Meanwhile, the industrial designer knows that we're going to do this new fangled grill. It's got to be make an impact in the marketplace and it's got to look flashy. But more importantly, what we're doing in the beginning is understanding all the things outside the time you're actually cooking, the part that you're focused on. Right, you're focused on designing this burner, which is really important to make sure that it works right. But designers out there thinking about, okay, what are all the other things that we can affect here? There's a lot to a grill when you think about from the time you purchase it, even that some of that decision-making process, to the time you have to clean off the grease off the grill, right? And there's, this only was probably a part of them. And so what this was talking about was if you're focused on just the grill and how the burner works. What about all these other things? How could we, this was called the Dome of Awesome, right? So how far could you expand your Dome of Awesome as a product developer? This is more for kind of the product manager side of things to help them think bigger about it. But I think it's good for the whole team to be thinking about it. So um, if you can make that burner easier to clean, then you save time here. So that's kind of how you can start to put those pieces together. 
next, superpower number three. Making decisions is really hard for product development teams. Um, again, there's a lot of inputs, there's a lot of choices to make, a lot of, a lot of questions to answer. Um, so, what we do by taking those sketches and, and starting to kind of show those and tell those stories, um, we use some other tools as well to kind of help, help make decisions. We need to see these things, we need to touch, feel them. These are physical products after all, so we need to start investigating what do these things, how they work, and how, what do they look like. So making simple foam core models, you know, from the CAD or just doing this stuff by hand, seeing how the interactions are, is this going to fit, is this the right scale, proportion. Um, starting to communicate color and material and finishes, this is how it's going to be made. I, like, I can't, if I draw a call out on it and say this is metal, and hand it to you, and what the hell is this? If I start to communicate this, you start to have an understanding of what the design vision is for this thing. It needs to have these things because that's what Bun, the brand, always has in all their products, so there's consistency there. Another example, um, probably one of the most boring products in the world, like an air mover, right? But this thing looks pretty sweet, so this kind of shows you, uh, not only does it look sweet, but it's highly functional versus what it was originally. So you can wrap the cord around it, it's got a bunch of different ways of being oriented, you can stack them, um, a lot of cool stuff can happen there. That's what we're communicating. This is uh, one I added last night, just because I think it's really important to start thinking about as designers and engineers, is VR, all right? So we're starting to mess around with this stuff, um, and it's really powerful as a design tool and as an engineering tool. Um, the example I don't have here is my counterpart, uh, Scott, who's been looking at giant rim mold presses, these big, ugly presses that just make parts all day. And if they're 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet, to be able to go out of your CAD screen where you're trying to see things and go and see and walk up to it, you can learn that much more, right? So pretty cool. And what's cool about this, if we're testing different concepts with people, be it how it functions or how it looks, we can show them different concepts in a context that they understand. If you show them a picture or a model in this room, I'm not sitting by the fire. I'm not imagining what it is to be in my, you know, my backyard or my deck. Suddenly with VR, you can put them there. So you can put them in a factory with that rim press that I'm talking about and you suddenly have much more context. You have that many more questions answered that you couldn't have before. And I'm not saying this replaces prototyping by any means. Physical prototyping is already very powerful. But this gets you there as another, <coughs> another, way to as another tool. All right, working with ID. How do you work with us? Um, well, leverage those three points I just said earlier, which I already forgot. But, um, so <laughs> we're going to talk about the kind of collaboration. And so I showed that Venn diagram earlier. We're talking about desirability and feasibility. And so we want to be in this spectrum somewhere. You guys are focused here with your skill set. We're focused up here with our skill set. But I think we want to be able to move a little bit further <coughs> out of this zone and out of this zone. So we want to kind of try to meet more in the middle as much as we can while understanding all this other stuff. All right, so you think about some of the products out there that are beautifully designed and, more importantly, beautifully engineered. Here's one, and how successful were these, right? Massive success. You don't see any fasteners on these, which is pretty cool. So you think how many arguments were about, should we hide the fasteners? Well, you know what? If both the engineer and the designer were looking at what's out in the marketplace and understand how people perceive products, they probably knew, no, we can't have fasteners. And they knew that together. There probably wasn't enough reason. Um, think about Crown, and this is kind of an older picture, but you know, it looks heavily designed, but for good reason. I think especially when you look at the cockpit of this thing, you know, they might have been like, why does everything need to be curvy? Why can't we have a few more straight lines? Because we need to be able to communicate comfort to the user. We need to be able to communicate that they can sit in this thing for a long time. And therefore, they get more production value out of it, if that's the right way of putting it. And of course, there's Dyson, which kind of wears its engineering right on its sleeve, right? It looks awesome because there's a good, again, good symbiotic relationship between those designers and those engineers. Oh, and then there's this beautiful thing, which I'm going to dive into a little story. So, project I got to work on. This is the 2012, I think, <coughs> session 9.9. .9. This is a bike that's designed to go down some serious terrain. And it's made of carbon fiber, which was a big deal back then because nobody thought carbon fiber could handle the kind of abuses that this bike was intended to go through. So, speaking of that, there's me, the industrial designer, looking very designerly, and there's Brad, who we met before. This is how I'm thinking about the problem. This is how Brad's thinking about the problem. 
He's seeing all these like red eyes when he puts it under the FDA. He's like, oh, holy crap, we're going to be screwed when we go out there. And I'm like, yeah, we'll see. You know, and I'm thinking about brand form language, which is something I wish I could get into more, but thinking about what does a trek look like? What elements make a trek a trek? <coughs> and he's thinking about how, he's thinking even farther down the road, like how are we going to make this thing, right? Which is good. I'm glad he's thinking about these things. But Brad is taking a lot of guesses. Brad hasn't been out on these trails like I have. And he's thinking it needs to look like this. It needs to be overbuilt. So he's seeing some of my design thinking, eh, it might, you know, might not be enough there. It's a really pixely picture. And Brad's worried about this happening, because this actually happened, as you can see, to an aluminum version of the bike. So understand, I understand his concerns. I say, how can I work with Brad to make things a little better? So Brad and I make a lot of compromises. Brad goes out with me to Whistler, British Columbia, and rides the bike and sees things for real, sees what kind of abuses these bike take, the bikes take. And from that trip, we have a very lovely relationship from there on, because we understand the context in which the product's going to be used in, and who's going to be using it, more importantly, because we see all these dudes that are dressed like Brad here with their helmets on their heads and looking really cool. Um, but you start to have a full story. And as a design team, Brad and I, we're able to make a better product. So. Uh, trying on aesthetics. So back to this thing here, which we were just talking about. Um, you can see one of the early engineering prototypes, right? So we just have what we have for tubing. We kind of cobble it together in our shop. We have the geometry, right? That's important. It's going to ride like it's supposed to ride. But it sure as hell doesn't look like it's going to leave a look, right? This is not going to end up in your bike shop floor. Shouldn't, anyway. This, on the other hand, looks a little bit more finished, like something you'd actually buy. Same here. Um, back to you saw that other uh, air mover. It's a dehumidifier that we worked on that is in the same family. Notice, one, that this looks like that air mover. Same visual brand language, same colors, same materials, same kind of shaping. And the point here <coughs> is that's what they had. Which one are you going to buy, right, if you saw these two next to each other, knowing that the performance is the same? You'd probably go with that. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about product look and feel. I said visual brand language. They're pretty interchangeable. Um, these are the elements that industrial designers are really paying a lot of attention to. And I think when I say shape, I mean form, you know, is it faceted, is it smooth, um, the color and the materials. What is it communicating? That's really what we're trying to think about. How are we communicating to the user what it's for, how it's used, how does it fit into their lives? So I want you to take the next, the next couple pictures, and I already said too, too late, but I'll give you extra time on this one. Think about one word that defines this to you. All right, and one word for this, or that, or this guy. Okay, the cars, cars are easy to gravitate towards. All right, so what did you guys say about Tesla? Give me one word that came up in your mind. First word that came in your head. You had words, someone did. <laughs> Beautiful. 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 Minimalist. Good, right? And I think they might have been trying to go after that as industrial designers and probably engineers too, knowing what the target was. So you can talk about this being robust and you know, tough, whatever you want there, you know, sleek, sexy, whatever you want there. But there's definitely some communication that's happening there visually through the form and the color material. That's important stuff. And that's what we're always like harping on. Our team about like it's got to look like this, and we can, you know, get a little overzealous about this stuff. But um, so I think the thing is, is what we're trying to do is identify how we want people to perceive it. Right? That's first and foremost. That's what industrial designers are trying to figure out. Um, and then we're trying to identify what design attributes make them feel that, and then we explore different ways of going about that and apply it. So we'll do a quick example here. This is an old medical device. Basically, it's a, uh, what do you call it when you have your baby a sonogram? It's kind of like that, but it's for bone growth. It, when, so when you break your bone and things aren't healing quite well, you get this little black puck uh, near the, where the break is, and it sends out sonic waves, and it helps bone growth, helps it heal faster. So this is their old unit, um, and they wanted to redesign it for a number of reasons. One, because it was a chunky box. Two, it, had, it needed an interface that improved efficacy. When I say improves e efficacy, that means People actually want to use it and use it as directed. 
So we looked at that, we talked to them, and we said, okay, you know, here's a company that doesn't really know necessarily what their brand really is supposed to look like, so we kind of have to tell them what it could look like. And we say, do you want to go this way, professional, modern? We start to think about these things, dimension, form, crisp lines, and we're seeing sort of put some images together. Notice how these images more or less relate to each other, just like if you saw a family of cars. Or do we want to go more fun, more soft, white color accents, you know, make it a little more inviting? And there's two very different ways of going about design if you have these two different directions, if you don't know where you're going. Right? The product that comes out of this versus the product that comes out of this, regardless of what's inside of it, are going to be very different looking, and maybe even work different. So there's some sort of combination. I wasn't part of this product, but somehow this comes out, and they kind of focus more on the inviting part of it, knowing that it's going to be used by people. All right. Uh, how did this work? Okay, so <laughs> I think I think I remember how this works. Um, so you see this list of words, A, B, and C, and uh, they all have <laughs> visual connotations to them. And so when you look at these three images, I want you to pick three words that come to mind out of this list. Okay, I'll give you a couple seconds. And then we're going to go to this one. What words make sense here? And the last one, I think, this one here. Okay. We don't need to shout it out. We don't need to play that game. But hopefully, maybe, if we did our kind of image board right, this is why we do these mood boards, as we call them, which I don't like that term, but it, it makes sense in what they do. We put together these images because we're trying to communicate something verbally. And it's a, there's obviously a lot of subjective area there, but it's important. So I would imagine some of these words from that list match with what you thought for these images. Same here, right? You see those form elements start to pull out. You see how these things match. So that's how industrial design is trying to think about what's on, you know, how the product looks. And that's just a very small kind of superficial part of industrial design. It goes a lot deeper than that. How people interact in ergonomics, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there's a lot there. So I'm kind of coming to a conclusion here where I want you guys to leave knowing these things. We're all designers, right? We're on the same team, and our goal is to get that product done and make it awesome. So if we can learn about each other and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses and learn how to harness those, we're going to make something better. And in, my, in that light, great engineers really understand design. And great designers, industrial designers, really understand engineering. Not to say we're replacing each other, but I've been almost replaced a couple times by engineers. It's pretty fun. Um, I think knowing those skill sets, knowing what we're good at, leverage us for that. Leverage idea, the idea to deal with ambiguity, to help you tell a story, to help you visualize something, to visually communicate this. Always challenge your designer. They don't say, oh, that's the design. I'm going to go with that and try to figure it out. Nah, ask some tough questions. Force them to think differently about it. That's important. That's what I value in an engineering partner and someone that challenges me. Um, aesthetics matter, okay? I think that bike picture and that uh, dehumidifier picture can pretty quickly communicate that. Product look and feel matters to the brand you're working for. So if you do leave here and you're working for, I'll use Weber again as an example, they have a very specific way that their products look and feel, and you need to maintain that. You can't go off on some weird path um, because the people won't understand, consumers won't understand it's really Weber anymore. Um, so that's important. So understand that and know how to help your design team keep that going. Um, and I think I think the other thing is, that's really important, I forgot to put on here, but I think understanding user needs together. That's really, in the end, what you're all trying to do. You're trying to solve for some user's needs and make something that matters to them and impacts their lives. All right, that's what I had. You all look very nonplussed. Questions and stuff. Thank you, Steve.